Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Kara Carmack, the Exhibitions and Public Programs Officer at the New York Studio School, and I'm honored to welcome you to our Spring 2023 Evening Lecture Series. We're thrilled to host Harry Cooper's talk tonight entitled Gustin's Urgency, the Capacity of Painting. And since Gustin was a distinguished early faculty member here, this evening is especially near and dear to us at the school. Before we begin, I would like to note that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is free to the public with support in part by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Additional funding is generously provided by the Robert Lehman Foundation, the Samuel H. Kress Foundation, and individual donors. Please consider making a donation to help keep our evening lecture series free by clicking on the support button on our homepage. Thanks to those of you joining us virtually and here on 8th Street. We will reserve time at the end for a Q&A with the audience. For those in the room, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you so our online audience can hear your question. For our Zoom audience, please submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Following the lecture, Please join me and our guests downstairs in the clay room for light refreshments. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening. Harry Cooper is Senior Curator of Modern Art at the National Gallery in Washington, DC. 
He earned his PhD from Harvard in 1997 with a dissertation on Mondrian and worked at the Fogg Art Museum for a decade before joining the National Gallery in 2008. He has organized or co-organized exhibitions on Mondrian, Medardo Rosso, Frank Stella, and Stuart Davis. His latest show, a Philip Gustin retrospective, just opened last week in Washington and will be on view through August 27th. Now please join me in offering a warm welcome to Harry. <laughs> Good evening, thank you. It's amazing to see this crowd of my uh, friends and admirees here. Really appreciate it. Um, and I wanna thank Graham Nixon for inviting me and uh, he has been the heart and soul of this school since 1988 and I don't know if this is done, but I want to applaud Graham. <laughs> This is my, um, I also want to thank Kara Carmack for, for the logistics and um, anyway, this is my uh, fifth talk here. Uh, my first was in 1996 when I was working on a Mondrian retrospective. Um, when you host SNL, you know, five times, you get, a, you get a special jacket and you get inducted into a special club. Kara, is, is anything happening uh, for me? No, okay. Um, so yes, there's a Philip Gustin show that opened uh, Thursday at the National Gallery. And I thought I'd start uh, by giving you a quick tour since you probably haven't been down there, although I know a couple of you have. Um, okay. Uh, so not a complete tour, but uh, here's the approach with uh, the National Gallery's own painting rug, 1967, a gift of Ed Broida. And then uh, down the stairs, the introduction and uh, photo of Gustin in his Chelsea studio, 1961, and the painter's table, 1973, um, a promise gift of Ambassador and Mrs. Blinken to the National Gallery, um, as well as a, a quote there, um, there's a forgotten place of beings and things, um, which I need to remember, I want to see this place. I want uh, it uh, help me. <laughs> uh, I paint what I want to see. Yes, title of Muse's recent book of well, Philip's recent book. Yeah, <laughs> of writings. Um, so moving into the galleries, uh, we see Mother and Child from 1930, uh, and it's on loan from Muse Mayor to the National Gallery, and she is here with us, Philip's daughter, which. Uh, I appreciate as a uh, major supporter and lender to the show. Um, you see uh, Philosopher in Space Time, 1935, uh, Bombardment, 1937. Around the corner, Gustin's works from the early 1940s. And then the later 1940s when he is inching toward abstraction the early 1950s, starting with white painting 1951 from SF MoMA, other great examples. And then a kind of reverse angle showing how this gallery bends around to culminate in the black on gray uh, head from the Tate there, 1965. Here's a closer look at that sequence from 58 to 65. And then we have on the right the ink and brush drawings from 66 to 67 when Gustin was in a kind of crisis, stopped painting, uh, wanted to work out what he was going to do next. Um, this photo mural shows him in Florida where he was teaching for a year or so and working on these drawings. It seems that as soon as he finishes them, he scatters them at his feet. Um, And down the hall there, you see uh, the small panel paintings uh, that followed where he built his new vocabulary starting in 1968. There's a closer view of them. And across this wide hall um, is a quote from Gustin. 
I'll just take white and I'll take cadmium red medium, which is my favorite color, and mix it up to create a mess of pink. That pink makes me want to paint. So that explains everything. Um, at the end there, there's um, Painter's Forms, 1972, where he is, uh, he is spitting out his, uh, his motifs. And then um, on the other side of that wall is a room that recreates uh, part of the 1970 Marlboro Gallery exhibition where Augustin unveiled this new language of uh, cartoony, huge scale paintings, uh, many of, of hooded figures, uh, Klansmen um, uh, primarily. Another shot of that gallery. This is in the lower level of the East Building where we have very nice spacious rooms and ceilings. So there are 12 of the paintings of the some 30 plus paintings that were in the Marlboro show. Um, coming out of there, this is another sort of U-turn in the show showing uh, this time moving from the earlier to the later 1970s. Uh, sort of a progression to dark paintings that, that mirrors what happened in the 60s. Um, couple in bed from the Art Institute, along with a little flashback to Gustin's work as a government muralist and wartime illustrator in the late 30s and early 40s. There's a closer look at that, including uh, at the bottom there, a study for a mural that is uh, in the uh, GSA building right, at, right down the street from the National Gallery. And uh, three of the black paintings from 1978 to 79. And then a final room where we see the street again on the left from the Met. And a trio of paintings on the right from 1979, I think among Gustin's last paintings. There's a closer view of the trio, which I've always wanted to put together. And hooray, we got the loans, thank you. Um, and uh, you can see there's a little pegboard on the right, something we've started to do to allow visitors to post their comments and see what other people are thinking. And uh, a couple of the first comments. <laughs> there were some others which I, you know, I, I cropped this one. <clears throat> so talking about Philip Gustin makes me very nervous, uh, especially here. Um, when Mercedes Matter founded the school in 1964, she hired Gustin to be on the original faculty, and he continued to be a major presence for, uh, for a decade. Um, but just as important as his teaching were the famous uh, long talk sessions that he had um, between 67 and 74 for anyone who wanted to listen, often with his friend Morton Feldman, who was dean of the school for a couple of those years, uh, the composer. Um, in fact, over one third of the pages in Gustin's collected writings are conversations that happened he here at the studio school. Um, with Feldman, a fellow Jew, the talk was often about things like the Holocaust, Kierkegaard, the importance of bearing witness, just another light evening. Um, another frequent interlocutor was poet and friend Clark Coolidge, with whom Gustin talked more about process and image making. Coolidge, who edited the collected writings, explains, he would drive down from Woodstock, replenish his supply of can canvas and paint, have a big meal, usually Italian, and spend the rest of the day with the students talking, showing slides, commenting on students' work, ending up eating and drinking into the late hours with anyone still awake and able to continue the conversation, <laughs> unquote. Um, so those are some of the principal activities, talking, painting, smoking, eating, smoking again and drinking um, that made up Gustin's life and a lot of his imagery. This is one that um, we wanted and uh, did not come in the end to the show, but nice to see it here. So uh, my interest in Gustin began about 25 years ago. <laughs> I had just started my first job at the Fog, the Harvard Art Museum, and I became obsessed with two small paintings in the collection. The three, 1970 and untitled 1968. These are, you know, among those panel paintings we saw. 
um, about the same size and shape with the same palette and a shared vocabulary of black vertical strokes tattooed across the surface. Similar marks that somehow manage to represent half a dozen different things, as you can see. The compositional principle in one of the paintings is quite dumb. Uh, that is, just make it uh, as big as possible. Uh, and in the other, quite clever, seven triangles, as I count, uh, three white, um, two red, two black, each set pointing in different directions, up, uh, sideways, down. I tend to like things that are well packed, um, and Gustin uh, has packed the hell out of this painting. <clears throat> and it is about hell. Um, the interlocking shapes create a structure of tensile strength and power that seems appropriate for a painting about power and that, that uh, clenched fist at right, which is probably just something the Klansman is, is resting his cheek on, but it reads also as the fist, the pointing finger suggests the gun and so on. Um, the subject is all too clear, even if Gustin left it just beyond the reach of the title but we know what or who these three are. And I think the title, the three, rather than the three what, the three blank, it, it encourages, this, uh, encourages this kind of counting, I think, of the painting. Um, the other painting, the subject of, of that is completely opaque to me anyway. Uh, it isn't abstract, right? Uh, but it doesn't, uh, but what does it represent? Uh, a fortress with gun ports, a commercial toaster scene from above. Lots of toast. Um, a building, a book, a bread box. Is it living or dead, flesh or stone? Looking at it in storage 25 years ago, I felt there was something uncanny about this undecidable image. And the idea of the uncanny led me down a rabbit hole of psychoanalytic ideas about the unconscious, the return of the repressed, the dream work, as Freud called it, of condensation and displacement as they related to Gustin's biography, which I will not do tonight. I'm going to try to do something new. Um, so when I heard that uh, Yale University Art Gallery was planning to do a show of these small panel paintings, um, I jumped on it and uh, the show came to Harvard. Um, in the process, this is the catalog, in the process I was able to include um, some some earlier paintings like here uh, Harvard's Untitled of 64, Yale's Air 2 of 65. Uh, my essay for that catalog should have just focused on on these this small period. Instead, I, I tried to do the whole career and uh, I, I couldn't help it. I had a problem, a Gustin problem. Um, the problem didn't go away. Um, when I got to the National Gallery, the first thing I did really was just hang all of the Gustin, and he used the word hang advisedly, I guess, uh, all of the Gustin paintings that we had, paintings and drawings, actual and promised, um, in a tower gallery. Um, it was part of a series about inspiring contemporary art, but really I just, I wanted to see them in, in you know, out of storage and natural light. Um, selfish curator. Uh, about six years after that, in 2016, uh, Rusty Powell, the director, asked me to come up with a retrospective of a major post-war artist, so I proposed Gustin, and now, seven years after that, the show has opened, and I have solved my Gustin problem. <laughs> Not really. <clears throat> um, and so, uh, I'll come briefly to the elephant in the room. Did you know there was an elephant here? Uh, the elephant in the room is the, um, the fact that some of these paintings, which I couldn't stop looking at, are the very paintings that others did not want to be around, given the imagery of the clan, ropes, nooses, and in one case, lynching. I should have had an inkling that this would be a problem because when I, when I hung that show in the tower, um, several of the guards, and they're a, a really um, overwhelmingly African-American uh, group, um, did not want to work in that, in that room. We had conversations. I, um, sort of tried to explain where Gustin was coming from, not certainly not to say what the paintings meant or what their message was, God forbid, they should have a message, uh, they don't. But um, uh, the installation happened, some of the guards chose not to, not to work there. Um, so the current uh, 
So that's the that's the installation in the in the tower gallery, which is one of the few naturally lit spaces in the east building. Um, so uh, so what happened? Um, we got to the current show, which uh, opened last Thursday. It was supposed to open on June seventh, twenty twenty. Um, postponed by the directors of the four museums, first indefinitely, then for four years, and then after an open letter um, from uh, 2,500, uh, eventually 2,500 artists and curators and critics and so on, and probably including several of you. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands, but um, that uh, it was postponed for two years. And uh, I won't go into everything that happened. Um, lots of conversations I had. At, with people uh, inside the museum, outside the people, with um, the curators and of the other other museums on the tour, and I should mention this was a collaborative effort with um, Kate Neeson at the MFA Boston, Allison DeLima Green at Houston, um, and um, Mark Godfrey originally at the Tate. Now Mike Wellen there. Um, the checklist uh, did not change at the National Gallery. But I think the story uh, actually became clearer. The show became better. Um, the interpretation, I would say, is more caring without being careful. Uh, Augustine was not careful. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Here's another look at Painter's Table. Um, wonderful painting. So as a result of all this, I, I do think I started to see Gustin a little differently. Um, I came to see his art more than ever as powerful, electrifying, catalyzing, even explosive. Gustin talked about his work in terms of forces. Here are a few quotes. I think it's the devil's work. You know damn well you're dealing with forces. It's hubris. We're not supposed to meddle with the forces. God takes care of that. The Ten Commandments tell us not to make graven images. It's like making a golem. Only God can make life. As for the psychological overtones and so on, I don't think we want those forces to be evident to us. When they are somewhat masked, they seem to last longer for me. It's not given to me to know what these forces are. It's illegal. I had to deal with the solidity of things and gravity, forces. All good painting has always dealt with forces, with movement and magnetism, the magnetic pull of one form on another. There are two basic ways my forms work. Either they're coming apart or they're going together." Unquote. What all this adds up to, for me anyway, is the idea that Gustin was trying to master and channel overwhelming forces, moral, psychological, physical, at once compelled to do it and relishing the process in all of its edginess and illegality. Um, which brings me to my title, or I guess subtitle, um, because I only thought of it uh, the other day, so I, I made it a subtitle, The Capacity of Painting. Here's another look at the street from the Met, and don't miss the two spiders there at the bottom. Uh, Gustin was ambitious from the beginning, whether consciously or not, to pack as much as possible into a painting to get a simple rectangle covered with colors to contain as much as possible of art history, political history, the traumas of the world and of his own life, the highbrow and the low, the Renaissance and the funny pages, tragedy and comedy, often all at the same time. That's what I mean by capacity. But I'm also thinking of capacity in electrical terms, uh, where capacitance is defined as the amount of charge that can be stored in a system. I don't know a lot about electricity, uh, except that it's powerful and what is stored will be released, sometimes explosively. And when I spoke at the National Gallery, of course there was going to be a scientist in the audience and he came up to me later and he said, you, you did get it right. And in fact, in fact, um, weapons are often um, sort of uh, fueled by capacitors in, in the weapon system. Um, so this provides another way to look at the shape of Gustin's career, that well-known shape where he goes in three phases from figurative to abstract back to figurative ABA, like a sonata form. So another way to tell that story is, is, uh, is like this. Um, so in his early uh, career from 1930 to 1947, 
Gustin explored how much charge a painting could hold. After the war and the Holocaust, he came to accept that there were some things, some kinds of content that painting could not hold at all, which led to a crisis that may explain his turn to abstraction between 1950 and 1965, a period in which he discovered not what to paint, but how to paint. Finally, in his last years from 68 until his death in 1980, he returned to figurative painting, but with a difference. Rather than trying to pack individual paintings with many images, he focused more on more on something that had always been in the work, the question of how many meanings a single image, a light bulb, a rope, a hood, a bunch of legs, how many meanings a single image could have, whether within a painting or as it moved from painting to painting. His focus shifted from what painting could contain to what it could release, what it could let loose. What precipitated this was a turn to autobiography, at first indirect, the, the Klansman as a self-image, um, and then much more direct. It's this release of stored power in the late work, this opening of the Pandora's box, as Gustin put it, um, that I think is what we've been dealing with for, for a few years now. And um, now that the show is up, we'll deal with it some more for a long time. So, <laughs> love that. He was born, I'll do a little bio here, born Philip Goldstein in 1913 in Montreal to Jewish parents who had fled pogroms in Ukraine and the threat of conscription by the Tsar's army. Their goal was Los Angeles, which they reached in 1922. But while they had lived in a fairly comfortable Jewish quarter of Montreal, where Gustin's father was an iron worker for the railway, in Los Angeles, they fell on hard times. The father reduced to being a rag picker hanged himself, and 10-year-old Philip found the body and had to cut the thick rope to get it down. Uh, I didn't talk about it much, of course, but we have a couple of reports. There's a newspaper report that, that is different, I think, possibly, because that would have been quite a horrible uh, news item. Um, the mother was the rock of the family, and uh, in this picture, she seems to take special care of Philip at left the youngest. He often retreated to a closet, a private box, he called it, with a single bare light bulb, where he read and taught himself to draw. He was a gifted cartoonist and had several published in the LA Times while uh, he was still in junior high. In 1928, he entered Manual Arts High School, where he became good friends with fellow student Jackson Pollock. The two were passionate about art, took lessons after school, visited local collection, the, the Ehrensburg Collection, fought over issues of the Dial magazine, which was bringing the good news of modernism, of, of Picasso and, um, and T.S. Eliot and others uh, to them. Um, they got expelled together for a broadside, ridiculing the school's emphasis on sports. Augustine returned and graduated, Pollock did not. A couple of years later, another tragedy struck when Augustine's beloved older brother, Nat, there at the top, um, died after his own car, which he had neglected to break, uh, rolled backward over him, crushing his legs. Um, many of the images that Gustin favored and returned to compulsively without, he said, knowing why, the rags and the ropes, light bulbs and legs come from these early experiences, but they accumulate meanings as he goes on. This brings us to our first painting, Mother and Child, um, made when he was 17 years old. And uh, speaking of packing things into a painting, um, <laughs> he's, he's doing a pretty good job here um, with Max Ernst. Uh, I think the, the clearest uh, source, that's Ernst's very naughty uh, take on Madonna and Child, the uh, Virgin punishing the Christ child, with Breton, Eluard, and, and uh, somebody else looking on through the window. Um, De Chirico was, was a huge inspiration for him, and uh, he saw that painting in the Ehrensburg collection. Uh, Picasso's uh, neoclassical uh, inflatable nudes and uh, uh, Leger's mechanomorphs. Um, and of course, the Renaissance, uh, which I didn't even bother with here because uh, it's too big. But uh, um, Mother and Child, the, uh, of course, the, uh, the pavement in perspective, not, not in very good perspective, I think in purposely uh, bad perspective. I'm going to give Gustin that one. Um, 
And in the same year, Drawing for Conspirators, 1930, um, a beautiful, fairly large drawing uh, at the Whitney Museum. Um, so uh, this drawing then served as the source material for several paintings that he made um, in, uh, in solidarity with the Scottsboro Boys, the, the nine black youths accused of rape in Alabama in the summer of 1931, sentenced to death except for the youngest one. Court battle dragged on and on. It became a cause celeb of the American left because they, there was really no evidence against them. So uh, that drawing, uh, so powerful in, in its three moments, the uh, conspiracy of the title happening in the middle ground, um, a lynching in the far background juxtaposed with a sort of surrealist uh, crucifixion, and then the Klansman in the foreground who is uh, holding, fingering the rope like uh, rosary beads maybe, perhaps, uh, it's hard to say, that's the beauty of the hood, what he's feeling, what is shadowed in him. Uh, there's a painting later of a Klansman called Remorse. Um, but I think uh, just seeing these two paintings together and seeing the reflection of the poses and, you know, Augustine is thrifty and he's, he's recycling material and, and like a good Renaissance artist, um, you know, just flipping a pose. Uh, so if that's a mother on the left, it, it is in some way a father on the right. It is in some way his father. The, the rope then becomes a connection um, both to politics and, and, and uh, personal tragedy. Um, and, and I would say to some extent it is Gustin too who had to deal with the rope, of course. So one of those images that is packed um, with meanings. And uh, here's one of the paintings that it led to um, a fresco panel which was destroyed as I'll tell you in a second. Um, but you can see the Klansman at right there is, is uh, drawn from the drawing and uh, he is whipping a black youth who is uh, tied to a post. Um, and so this, uh, this now is, is when the Scottsboro uh, Fuhrer is happening and, and the painting uh, is shown along with paintings by a couple of his friends at the John Reed Club, one, one of this group of, of new communist clubs that around the country, there was one in, uh, near, near him in LA. And um, the uh, Red Squad, so-called of the LAPD, a sort of irregular force dedicated to um, busting unions and commies. Um, and uh, you can see there's, there's obviously the hammer and sickle up there, Chinese and Russian communism. Um, came in and, um, as Gustin reported, destroyed these murals on the left by his friend, clearly, uh, more clearly about the Scottsboro trial, um, with, uh, with, with guns and lead pipes. And uh, this um, was a fundamental moment for Gustin that he remembered, um, and a kind of lesson, a kind of object lesson in, in the power of the state and um, the, the uh, misalignments of, of uh, power and justice. Um, speaking of which, um, and this is all really before we've even made the first turn in the exhibition. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a tough and, and powerful uh, couple of decades, 30s and 40s. Um, so bombardment, um, which is um, Gustin's uh, Guernica, really. Uh, 1937, his response to the news of the bombing of the Basque town. And... Um, really like, not like that other Guernica that we know. Um, here's a comparison. Uh, he, had, he could have seen Picasso's in, in person or reproduction. Um, more like the Siqueiros response uh, to Guernica, Echo of a Scream, 37 uh, at MoMA, which he could also have seen, um, especially in that figure of the, uh, of the young boy who's uh, sort of being thrown up into the left in Gustin's painting. Um, so this is his, very much reflecting his, his muralist moment. He has, uh, in fact, um, probably worked with Siqueiros on a mural in L.A., and then Siqueiros uh, hooked him up with a mural commission in Morelia, Mexico, that he did with a couple of his friends. I think there's Thomas Hart Benton, too, for sure, in the, the figure at bottom. And once again, he's, he's packing everything in, but I suppose this goes against my idea of packing, too, because it's an explosion and everything is being thrown out. But I would answer myself, that uh, 
it's uh, the Tondo form has has sort of warped everything into this one point perspective. So even even the vertical say at the at the left become circles and there's this sense of containment, uh, kind of a, a globe. Uh, and perhaps as someone suggested to me the other day, the it 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 then becomes a sort of reflection on the world um, and uh, all the violence that it contains. Uh, moving ahead to uh, the later 40s, and this is uh, yet another index of uh, of uh, world historical trauma. Augustine's in St. Louis. He's seen the photographs of, of and films of the concentration camps that Joseph Pulitzer brought back and showed in St. Louis and other places. Um, that especially that figure at dead center staring out at us with the one eye, um, I think is very, very evocative of this. Um, and there's others where uh, we see striped uh, uniforms. Um, so let's see, um, just a comparison to uh, Beckman here, the trapeze. Uh, Titian, Flaying of Marcius, Gustin's huge visual culture, so that pretty much anything I can come up with, he probably saw. Uh, and if he didn't, well, you know, he would have liked to. <laughs> but this uh, sort of mode in his work had, had been happening, you know, long before he got that news. Here we have Marshall Memory from 1941 with the same kind of packing in the orthogonals and the the wooden um, elements, um, the turning away of faces, hiding of faces, masking, uh, headgear. Um, uh, one boy is even wearing a kettle, which will show up uh, uh, much, much later. The trash can lids will show up later, too. This idea of uh, play fighting as a way of um, transcribing, uh, perhaps, uh, what's going on in, in, with uh, the beginnings of World War II. Um, or this painting from 1940 five uh, culmination of his work in Iowa. Basically, in, to the bio a little more in the 40s, he is in the Midwest uh, teaching, first in Iowa, then in St. Louis, um, which is very significant because he wasn't in New York uh, precisely at the moment when everything was happening in New York. The Surrealists were there from Europe. The young future New York school artists were were finding their way. And Gustin was painting these, um, you know, Venetian inspired, Beckman inspired uh, fantasias, uh, you know, of um, with a beautiful touch and um, you know a commitment to to the figure. There's the striped uniform at left. Uh, that young boy is holding a light bulb. You can see which has gone out. Um, and uh, can't help mention that uh, uh, Musa Mayor, as a three-year-old, two or three-year-old, is there with the crown. One of the few figures um, where we we get a, a clear view of her face, although her eyes are still shadowed, but a very tender moment. Um, or, or gladiators at MoMA. One of one of my favorites. Gustin referred to this as his Renaissance cubism, and he was very interested, I think, in knots and knotted structures. Um, perhaps the, uh, the 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 famous Leonardo Battle of Anghiari, the uh, horsemen locked in combat. Um, and I always want to pull something here. I want to pull the tail of the dog because nobody, nobody else is. Everyone's pulling something, but that is unpulled. Or the uh, the rope there, at right, which um, doesn't have any end. And in fact, all the all the eight hands are occupied, so nobody is holding the other end of that rope. And uh, I would say perhaps that's because the rope is um, sort of goes beyond the narrative into into uh, the symbol of uh, you know. Uh, blank, uh, you can fill in the blank. So uh, there is Porch again on the right and three paintings. It's not a triptych, but kind of a trio of paintings anyway that he worked on very hard and long from uh, 1947 uh, to 1950. Um, and you can see uh, the tormentors at left where there's traceries of, of hoods and musical instruments um, to review in the middle where there's a horizon, but that's about it in terms of recognizable things. To uh, finally red painting, and the title change is significant. He has entered into abstraction, and um, and 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 then we have to uh, move into the next room. 
Uh, but before, uh, he does make this trip to Italy and uh, gets to see the artist that he, he venerates. Um, this is a much later painting called Pantheon, where um, he lists them, Masaccio, Piero, dot, dot, dot. We don't even need to know that it's Piero della Francesca, Giotto, Tiepolo. De Chirico, I think, is off to the left only because he's a, he's a modern, so he's in another category. Um, and, uh, and I would emphasize, this is the Italian pantheon, you know, the pantheons in Rome. So this is Italy because he had a French pantheon, a Dutch pantheon, and, and others. But the Italians had a special place for him. Um, so what happens in, in the 50s um, with, uh, first of all, white painting, uh, his kind of legendary at this point, first abstract painting in New York. Uh, so he's back in New York and catching up with what's been going on. Um, Pollock, his old friend, has ridiculed him in a drunken moment for all that romantic figure to painting he was doing. Um, and that may have had a, that may have hurt, but I think more important, he, he had, he's realized that he himself was dissatisfied with his earlier work and it wasn't conveying what he really felt. Um, well, what he needed to convey about the world, about himself. Um, so, so he, um, he makes this painting, and it's, it's a beautiful, very delicate, uh, hardly painted painting um, with no frame, as you'll see in the show, um, and just conjuring the, these shapes, these strokes um, out of the canvas. Uh, he said that he, he painted it with a rule that he wouldn't step back to look at it. So everything, the gadgets are just in his peripheral vision. You know, I don't know if, how strictly he held to it, but that was the spirit of it, no planning. He's not doing those preparatory drawings that, that he often did before. And, um, and this leads to a, a beautiful period of painting. Uh, through the 50s, color comes back in. He starts to find his palette and his, his touch. And I think, um, you know, if Gustin hadn't done this, um, he, things would have been very different when he returned to the figure. But he's, he's found a way to open up. And it reminds me of, of a drawing class I took uh, with Bill Christenberry at the Corcoran. Very, very great drawing teacher. Um, and I had, uh, I had made a drawing that I was proud of, you know, drawing uh, the figure, all the lines were in the right place. The shading was within the lines. I think I was using like three chalks or something. And um, he said to me, I was, I was proud of it. I showed it to him. He said, uh, yes, you're drawing like this. And, and he made a fist. And he said, uh, try drawing like this. And he opened up his hand. Um, and I tried, and uh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gustin has opened his hand, but you know what gets let in pretty quickly is, is, is a considerable darkness as well. Um, that beautiful, uh, what was called abstract impressionist moment um, is, is brief. Um, and, uh, Black uh, comes back in, scraping, uh, the colors are acid, uh, and, and then um, into the, uh, into 63, 4, 5, he's, he's doing much more with white and black, just wet on wet, and, and um, still working very spontaneously, but what emerges is these forms, uh, subject, the smoker, maybe simply called that for, for the palette there, um, but he starts to think of these things as heads. And so the figure is, uh, is creeping back. Um, and then we saw that painting from the Tate, uh, that kind of end point, 1965, the, 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 the black on gray head. And he stops and has a crisis, goes to Florida um, where he teaches and um, for a year or more and, and does these pure drawings, so-called ink, ink and brush on paper. 66 to 67, which are actually among my favorite uh, works. Um, and uh, we have uh, 10 of them here. Um, and then it goes back to Woodstock where he has, he has been since off and on since he discovered it in 1940, but now um, having moved up there now, finally in 67, starts to do these so-called object drawings, charcoal on paper um, and uh, very different. And he's tortured, and he's, he's doing those in the studio and then going across the way to the house where the, the pure drawings are, are hung and uh, 
feeling like he can't decide uh, what to do. He's full of doubt and uh, possibility. And in the end, um, the object drawings win, of course. And he decides that that, um, that is the way. Um, and this is happening you know, in the summer of 68, which is the most uh, conflicted uh, period maybe in, 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 in uh, recent American history, uh, assassinations, protests, uprisings, riots. Um, he wants to transcribe that some way. He wants to index that. But I think also the very process of going back and forth wildly between these poles is a sort of reflection of, um, of that polarizing moment. Um, which then leads to this wonderful explosion of, of vocabulary here in the, uh, the little panel paintings, um, which, which aren't just, they are before the Marlboro Show, but they continue up through 1972, even into 1973, because I think they're not just preparation, they are, they are wonderful works um, in themselves. Um, but he does put many of those elements together in, in these massive uh, billboard size, movie screen size uh, paintings. Um, and and I, I wonder, you know, why? Why so big? Why so big? Is this, is this his, um, you know, reflection on public art, the mural moment that he had? I think, you know, partly, but also he is, um, he's a gestural painter, and he's painting with his whole body now, and he needs, he needs the scale um, to do what he wants to do. Um, this is courtroom from 1970. Uh, we have a few quotes on the wall. Um, this one I like. Um, Unless painting proves its right to exist by being critical and self-judging, it has no reason to exist at all, or is not even possible. The canvas is a court where the artist is prosecutor, defendant, jury, and judge. Art without a trial disappears at a glance. So you have to live it, experience it, fight through it. And of course, there's no winner because if the you know, defendant wins, then the prosecutor loses. Um, you know, it's that kind of situation. Uh, somebody once asked him, and this is in the Michael Blackwood film, Michael Blackwood, who just, just left us, um, um, which we're showing in the show continually, wonderful hour long. And he's asked at one point uh, by, not sure who it is, but I think a somewhat somewhat naive uh, interviewer, are you are you, are you a pessimist? <laughs> and he says, um, I'm not a pessimist. I'm doomed. <laughs> and this hangs next to it, um, Dawn. So the courtroom is is uh, from the uh, Robin J. Meyerhoff collection, promised to the National Gallery. This is at Glenstone Museum, so they will, they will be close by at some point. Um, Dawn from 1970, um, which he, you know, he's a nighttime painter, and he said he painted this all through the night, and then the sun rose in the morning, and he put the sun in, and then he heard birds, and he saw birds on the wire, and he put them in. And um, a little hopeful moment there uh, on the left, um, the clan uh, riding through with their victims behind. Uh, it's horrible. It's horribly funny. It's Gustin, you know, mixing um, the funnies with um, uh, tragedy. Um, why? Why is he doing that? I, um, that's that's up for grabs, of course. Uh, but is it a, is it a defense mechanism? Is it? I I think of it as a kind of um, maniera in a way. The the think you know of, of say the the pastel colors of a deposition by Pontormo and you know, it's, it's, it heightens the feeling when, you, when you're dealing with that kind of impossible uh, conflict right in front of you between the form and the content. Uh, thank you, Sidney Friedberg, for that. I took his uh, class uh, a few years ago. <laughs> um, or this uh, really monumental but smaller painting, the studio from 1969. And you see his, uh, his initials there, PG, in the small kind of oval um, medallion at the lower left, that was an indication that um, the painting is special and it is not for sale. And indeed, it never, it never was for sale. Um, where the Klansman becomes, becomes an artist, and, and this, this leads to a lot of things, a lot of thoughts. Um, I have a, a few associations. Um, there's the Groucho Marx quote, 
I would not join any club that would have me as a member. Um, he has joined the club that would would not have him as a member. Um, the uh, Walt Kelly, the cartoonist Pogo, one of Gustin's heroes, along with with Harriman of Crazy Cat, uh, did a poster for Earth Day 1970 in which he he famously had the line, "We have met the enemy, and he is us." So a reflection on evil internal to to himself to everybody caught red-handed if you will um and uh so why the return to the clan and why at this point um he said uh the kkk has haunted me since i was a boy in la in those years they were mostly there to break strikes i drew and painted pictures of conspiracies and floggings cruelty and evil in this dream of violence, I felt like Isaac Babel with the Cossacks, as if I were living with the Klan. And Babel rode, a Jew, rode with the Cossacks, documented what they were doing, and almost had a double life um, as a uh, nighttime writer and a daytime Cossack. Um, so Gustin says, uh, felt as if I were living with the Klan. What do they do afterwards or before? Again, he can't quite say what afterwards or before smoke drink sit around their rooms light bulbs furniture wooden floors patrol empty streets dumb melancholy guilty fearful remorseful reassuring one another question mark and there he is um and uh, the self-portrait aspect is only heightened by the fact that his he has a cigarette in his pointing hand there um so uh let's see where did i go um just got a little confused here. So um, he knows the Marlboro Show will be will be a, a critical disaster. There was like one and a half critics that liked it, and um, uh, literally uh, counted. And uh, so he he knew that, and he I think already had his tickets to Italy, and he he went off to Italy, did a, a wonderful series of Roma paintings, which are not in the show because I couldn't include everything, and then comes back to Woodstock and um where philip roth has has written our gang and the two phillips get together with their their nixon hating and gustin's inspired to do uh, poor richard this suite of 73 drawings um and you can see here um nixon uh there uh in the beach towel with uh, his dog checkers on top of him um and then and that that is um the, the glasses at the right sticking up are Henry Kissinger. He was just his thick glasses. Um, John Mitchell with the pipe, and that is uh, Spiro Agnew, the cone head with a couple of Frankenstein-like nails uh, in the uh, left, lower left of his head. Um, that's the title page. Um, and a few other things going on. This is, these are as hard to look at as, as anything because um, he's, he is trafficking in this racist imagery. The reason being that Nixon was a racist and he, um, he saw Nixon pandering to get the black vote, uh, planning the trip to China to, to get the Nobel Peace Prize or whatever, and, um, and so on. And, and for, for Augustine, that, that was the height of hypocrisy because he knew Nixon as, as a, a red baiter, McCarthyite, and so on. Um, so when he returns to painting, the hood has gone. He just says it, it left. Um, there's a couple of paintings where the hood does cohabit with this new character, uh, the, the Cyclops, the lima bean head, big eye, no nose, no mouth, cigarette, uh, worried forehead um, in bed, just like Nixon there. Um, uh, there's an identification with Nixon um, coming from a similar part of California and, uh, you know, this imagination, uh, the, this urge to identify with, with um, the enemy is fascinating. Um, and uh, we should point out the light bulb there on the left and the pull cord of the shade on the right. Um, and the light bulb, I think, here is depicted in such a way that it really, um, it really does read as a noose. It's empty inside. Um, and, and the pull cord maybe may even more so. And there's, there's even another pull cord uh, floating sort of uselessly in the, in the upper center of the painting, um, sort of Damocles maybe. There's the pointing finger sort of with red, red blood. I'm glad I don't have a pointer. That way you have to look for these things. Um, plate of French fries, you can see steak fries, uh, I guess, uh, one of the great paintings um, for sure. And then 
he is joined by um, another character, the Cyclops is joined by uh, the figure of his wife, um, who had centrally parted hair. You can see it there, and um, she is submerged. She had had a stroke, and um, she was his great support and believer, and uh, uh, very talented in her own right as a painter and especially a poet. But you know, it was a certain era, and uh, um, her poetry is now available. But we see her um, also uh, characteristic with with uh, two little vertical lines so that she apparently had above her her brow spiders in the background and this is the moment really when um, instead of packing each form with meaning I think the, the the forms gain meaning as they move from painting to painting and sort of proliferate and open up and um, one thing that uh, Sarah Boxer just pointed out to me is that those spiders at the top um, could very much be a kind of displacement of, of Muse's uh, eyelashes. And uh, he, they were long and he loved, he loved her eyelashes. So things are starting to migrate around rather than being packed together, you could say, going from, from condensation to displacement, from metaphor to metonymy or metamorphosis, uh, if you will. And uh, in fact, uh, here, here she is with those lovely uh, eyebrows and hair, red blanket. Again, one, one that we wanted, couldn't quite make it to the show. Um, so, uh, and on, on the left here, you see a couple more of, of these, what I'm calling Musa form paintings, which I, I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, uh, here's, here's one more realistic, <laughs> uh, relatively, uh, Augustine in bed uh, with her. Um, but what he's clutching is his, his own emaciated legs and paintbrushes. Um, she seems to be weighed down by that triangle, which is, um, you know, a reinforce. You all know it's a reinforcer for the back of a back of a strainer, wooden wooden stretcher. Um, wristwatch always there. Um, here is Musa in another form, a sort of uh, sunrise, sunset, uh, brain coral uh, tendrils of hair there. Um, uh, tortured legs, uh, maybe referring to a deposition here with the latter, 1978. Um, two more. Uh, she is a sunrise and a sunset because she's emerging from and sinking into the covers on the left. Um, a, but a, a wonderful, uh, hopeful painting there. And then a black sea on the right where she has become a kind of a horseshoe or, or a, a soles of shoes. You know, that he's, he, we've seen all the shoes with the nails. I haven't really emphasized that, but uh, from the funny pages from way back. Um, but why Black Sea? Well, Augustine, I mean, o Odessa is a Black Seaport, obviously. His, his um, parents were from that part of the world, whether it was actually Odessa or nearby. And, um, and um, Isaac Babel, IB, 2 IB, 1977, was also from Odessa. And so the horseshoe is associated to the Cossacks riding um, through the, uh, the Jewish neighborhoods, um, terrorizing. It's a horrible image um, of uh, castration and uh, and other kinds of uh, other kinds of slaughter on the left, with the, the clock becoming a a sunrise. I guess Odessa imprinted there. Uh, he said at one point, maybe maybe the, the maybe this family fantasy about Odessa is real. Uh, almost to say that it might not have been Odessa, but you know, my my grandmother. Uh, said she came from Odessa. I, I think she did, but it, it, it is almost a kind of shorthand for, um, for the, uh, the Jews who uh, had to flee uh, the Tsar. Um, and this is uh, just not, it's, the, the painting on the left is, is a little uh, acrylic and ink on illustration board, 1980. Uh, he died early in 1980, very last works here smaller scale he's he's sick he's had a heart attack and then going back um i'm just comparing this to a remorse great uh marlboro painting um that we we could not include um just because um couldn't have everything but uh 1969 and uh so you know that pile of cherries uh okay i don't have to spell this out do i <laughs> It's in the shape of a hood. No, no pile of cherries could stand on its own that way. He's he's shaped them into the hood. We've got the same palette, and um, 
and so is it a kind of uh, rescue job, a, a, a nice transformation of, of that horrible material into something juicy and at the end of his life? Uh, uh, yes, I think in part, but they're also uh, uh, cherry bombs with their little fuses, little fireworks. So there's still that little sense of, uh, of some kind of threat. Um, and, you know, it's all, it's all tied together. Uh, um, talking, um, we saw that before, the, the pull cord, the smoke, uh, rhyming forms that are, are uh, sort of ramifying and spreading uh, through the canvas. Um, and uh, speaking of the, um, the wristwatch, there the wristwatch sort of riveted to his arm, and notice the paint stained sleeve as well. Um, before Musa had her, had her stroke in, in the earlier 70s, they collaborated on these poem pictures. He did this with other poets too. So this is her poem. I thought I would never write anything down again. Then I put on my cold wristwatch. Um, and Gustin's illustration, some of his favorite things, but also some of Muse's favorite things associated with her, the nests that she collected, the seashells, um, snails. And uh, so, yeah, uh, Piero, uh, just to finish up, because it's late, and uh, I need to find where, uh, this was something I was going to read, <laughs> but I'm not sure I got it here. Um, he, he was a great, critic of art too. And uh, am I going to have to remember this? I'm going to, oh, here it is down here. Maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, here it is. Okay, so the flagellation. <laughs> um, one of his favorite paintings, a really surprisingly small painting. Um, and Gustin uh, really toiled over a short essay about it. Um, and he writes, this is a 19, uh, mid 60s, uh, early 60s. Everything is fully exposed. The play has been set in motion. The architectural box is opened by the large block of the discoursers at the right, as if a door were slid aside to reveal its contents, the flagellation of Christ, the only, quote, disturbance in the painting, but placed in the rear as if in memory. The picture is sliced almost in half, yet both parts act on each other, repel and attract, absorb and enlarge one another. At times there seems to be no structure at all, no direction. We can move spatially everywhere as in life. Perhaps it is not a picture we see, but the presence of a necessary and generous law. And uh, here his uh, bullet, still on the bulletin board in, behind his painting table, the reproduction of flagellation as well as Piero's baptism, as well as that quote um, that I believe his wife found for him from Dickens, which he loved and it's, uh, I'll let you you read it, uh, but it's it's kind of I see it as a kind of warning sign, like stay away. I'm busy, you know. I'm totally devoted to art, and uh, I put everything else away from me. Um, so, so what is that generous law he just talked about? Possibly it is not a picture we see, but the presence of a necessary and generous law. Um, Thirteen years later, in a letter to his friend Ross Feld, 1978, he said more about the generous law. And I'll give Gustin the last word here. Um, now he's not talking about a sort of a sliding door with contents, you know, inside, but he's talking more about opening out, opening up, which I think is where uh, Gustin was going, would have continued going and taking us um, in the late work. Uh, he says, I think you are writing, uh, Feld has just written him a letter, we don't know what. Um, I think you are writing about the generous law that exists in art a law which can never be given, but only found anew each time in the making of the work. It is a law, too, which allows your forms or characters to spin away, take off, as if they have their own lives to lead. Unexpected, too, as if you cannot completely control it all. I wonder why we seek this generous law, as I call it, for we do not know how it governs and under what special conditions it comes into being. I don't think we are permitted to know. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for that very rich conversation and presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, 
Harry. Thanks for the fantastic talk. Um, I have a question that is I feels kind of anachronistic, but that feels maybe fair because I feel like a lot of the problems you ran into with the show were rooted in anachronism. So I'm wondering about how Gustin would have understood his own practice. And it strikes me that um, with this sort of multifarious dimensions from the writing, the political drawings, like the Nixon drawings, even the kind of Bacchanalian rituals you opened with. If he was a young artist today, we might talk about it as a kind of social practice or an activist practice, right? And But I'm wondering if for him, painting remained a space apart, if he saw that as a kind of autonomous practice or if he himself would have understood it as kind of fluidly connected to all these other activities. Well, luckily I've read the writings enough that I, I have a, a quote that's apposite. Um, where he says, you know, as a young man, he was a political artist. He was committed. He was engaged. And um, and then and in the 70s, um, he says that he he is not. He doesn't have the illusion that his art can change anything, but he still wants to, in some way, uh, reflect and reflect on what's going on in the world. So it's kind of a engaged uh, disengagement. Um, and we see him you know, in this pattern of sort of approach and retreat to uh, to New York, which, you know, um, he eventually leaves entirely. So needing that refuge, but I wouldn't say that he is like um, sort of a, uh, an, an Adorno kind of idea of art as a total autonomous space apart. He had read Adorno, um, but I think that he's, um, that's that's the the fascination of it, that, that he wants to stay engaged even in this uh, pessimism. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions for Harry in the room? I know I went kind of long, so, you know. <laughs> well, it was is, so rich. I think you answered a lot of our questions I know. along the way. The reception will be rich. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, great. Okay, we have an online question, Harry. Um, and this is about his color palette. Um, could you speak a little bit more about this, this sort of pink tone? Um, our, our questioner is mentioning that it often represents politeness and, and sweetness, and is he using it to juxtapose the harshness of the imagery that we then see in his work? Um, I, I would answer what I usually do is, is you know, um, that could be right. <laughs> you know, um, he certainly, um, didn't want to pin down these things. Um, he did refer to his use of a nice um, Sunday pink comic color. So the, the, the colored funny pages on Sunday with that sort of weak, that weak uh, color, the pink. Um, we saw his quote about just loving pink. He did, um, and, and that cadmium red was his favorite color because he said it held the plane. It didn't, you know, it didn't recede. It didn't advance. It just was there. So. Does pink hold the plane? I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe not as much, but it, 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 it's a relative of the cadmium uh, red for sure. Um, but I think um, all those ideas of, you know, femininity, of lightness, of, I mean, you love Tiepolo, um, and that, that clash with the content, I think, um, as the questioner is suggesting, is, is uh, very interesting. And another question online, had he ever gone back to abstraction or did he completely leave that in the past when he returned to the figure? Um, I would say just to be um, sort of difficult that the whole abstraction figuration thing, you can forget about it. You can forget about it. I mean, we saw the figure emerging within the abstraction, maybe almost from the beginning, um, if you, if you look closely in a certain way. And then we see in the Marlboro paintings um, these wonderful passages that aren't, aren't doing anything uh, really representationally. Um, so I would say yes. Whatever the question was, I would say yes to, the, uh, to it, yeah. There's one in the way back, and I think there was one up here too. Way back. Terrific talk. Thank you. Harry, I have a question. Um, that triangle that's made of red and it has such an impact, 
surely is a reminiscent of the uh, Shada pyramid of strawberries. Yes. And uh, Shadan was making a very uh, major statement about the power of painting in relationship to the de devastating world and savagery that was going on in the Thirty Years' War uh, around that studio that he was painting in. So I think Gustin may have been well aware of that pyramid of uh, wild strawberries. And well, it was... you. Thank you. And uh, I had thought of the wild strawberries partly because they were in the papers recently, having set a crazy auction record for for uh, Shardown, that the, the triangle of wild strawberries. Um, and I'm sure Gustin would have had some things to say about that, too. Um, thanks, Graham. I'm just wondering uh, which who who among his peers did he care about? What other artists did he look at late in life? <laughs> well, um, you know there there were um, he was he was part of that circle certainly in New York. Um, de Kooning was close to Rothko. Visited him in in Woodstock. Um, he had old friends that he that he stayed in touch with. Um, very much, and um, and then in the uh, last years, he he really hung out with the poets, and not so much with painters. A um, couple of exceptions, but um, he felt the young poets were were you know kind of kind of onto him in a good way, and so Clark Coolidge, uh, Bill Berkson, poets and critics, uh, Bill Corbett. Um, and uh, and others, um, and Clark is still with us, and hopefully we'll be speaking at the National Gallery along with Musa and, and uh, reminiscing on uh, April twenty seventh. So, thank you, Harry. Do you think that maybe he influenced some artists like Mae Stevens, feminist artists, and also that picture of the porch that shows Musa as a young thing? Those two columns, are those a reference to the two columns of Venice? I heard you mention Venice in there. And I know the Academia hosted an exhibition of his work, right? Yes, thank you, Paula. I think um, those two columns are, are sort of the bedposts, but they are certainly ornate with finials on top and uh so um and what was the first part there oh may stevens i i think he, he influenced so many painters you know some of whom are here today uh with us um and um i think it was the painters who when gustin was not selling any work and he really sold almost no work in the in the 70s and david mckee just stuck by him the dealer um, it was young painters who were going to David's shows and being inspired by, by the work. And I think uh, when we were uh, putting the catalog together and sort of soliciting short statements from painters, we, we, we had uh, a lot, we had a lot <laughs> to choose from. Um, not to say that they all liked it, you know, for sure, but, but uh, I think he, he is sometimes credited with that, you know, the return of, of, of painting in the 70s and the figure and uh but i think it's it's really more than that it's just certain certain um sort of uh, inspired reactions but i'm not going to name the names because uh i'm going to leave someone out so <laughs> and if i may harry to yeah. build on that um i wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the critical reception of his work i I loved your your note that one and a half critics yeah. liked his was it a 71 Marlboro show and I wonder if you could kind of speak to right. what that discourse was right that was uh John Perot I think in the uh village voice who liked aspects of it and um Harold Rosenberg certainly certainly very close to Gustin and uh stood stood by him um for a long time um yeah um so 
I did have something to say about that. Uh, the critics. <laughs> um, yeah, we got locked out of our apartment last night, so. <laughs> um, I think one critic who really who really got him in the in the fifties. Uh, speaking of the New York Studio School, was Leo Steinberg. Um, when other critics, and I think Louis Finkelstein among them, were talking about abstract impressionism, which Gustin uh, did not care for, and, and impressionism was not in his pantheon, um, Steinberg, and it's reproduced in other criteria, was talking about, um, I mean, these paintings that were beautiful, and somehow, maybe because he was talking to Gustin, uh, talked about th them as being stained with sin and nicotine you know, and uh, capturing the underside of those paintings. Um, so I think, uh, and then, you know, Burks and I mentioned uh, was a great, great critic of Gustin. I think it was, you know, it's, it was a small world and, and the, 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 um, there were critics who were close to him who, who, who really were sympathetic. And those were the, those were the people who, who I think really uh, understood what was going on. And then there was Hilton Kramer <laughs> um, who, uh, uh, wrote the the sort of uh, most uh, mean uh, review of the Marlboro show called um, A Mandarin Pretending to be a Stumble Bum, which I think is actually a very interesting title and does capture something about this this doubleness of, of Gustin and his great culture and his his love of the comics, but it was very it was very mean in the whole and, and the idea of, of pretense, so he was really dismissing the uh, the stumble bomb, which was so important. I mean, Gustin talked about making dopey paintings and how important it was to make dopey paintings, or um, quoting Isaac Babel to make the right to make bad paintings, um, which the uh, the Soviets were taking away from from artists. Uh, kind of a brain brain twister. We have uh, another really interesting question online, which is asking about the curatorial decisions that you made in DC and how they're similar or different to the other institutions to which it'll travel. Sure, um, as with a lot of shows, you know, it was, it was collaborative after I kind of got the ball rolling and, and we were joined by three great museums, Boston, Houston, and Tate, with three great curators. Um, who then helped put the checklist together. But once, once we did that, we, we had three different museums, three different kinds of audience, three different spaces, and the, the presentations in each place are very much up to those curators. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and that's, that certainly was, was fine with me uh, <laughs> because uh, one show is enough, so. Uh, the, the National Gallery is the big show. It's, we happen to have the biggest space, and it's the full retrospective. It's more classic. It's chronological. Um, Houston was going to be able to do that, but after the postponement and rescheduling, they ended up with a smaller space. And, um, but each show is very different, so uh, collect them all. If you, you know, well, you can collect one more, two more, National Gallery and the Tate. Great, thank you, Harry. I think we have time. Just I'm just conscious of everyone's time. Um, a question about um, Gustin's painting technique. Um, the question is, did he work at all from direct observation with life models, for example? And also, could you speak to his approach to teaching in many ways, which is also really a beautiful way to end, mm -hmm. given that we're back in the studio mm -hmm. school. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I understand, and, and, and partly from Yuza, that he really didn't do a lot of uh, work from live models um, at all. And um, I think he had a, a tremendous visual memory and didn't really have to. <laughs> um, so he's looking and then he's, he's painting, but the studio, you know, is, is kind of this enclosed space. Um, and the teaching, I'm really, I'm really um, interested in. We have, um, we have people who, who um, were his students, and um, I, what I gather is that he was, he was really a crit kind of teacher. You know, do your thing, and I'm coming in, I'm coming to town, and I'm going to tear you apart. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, you're nodding there, yeah. So, um, and then let's go have a drink and some Chinese food and talk all night 
about you know everything. Um, so uh, I I I think that was you know, and that that's that's uh, not an unusual style, right? <laughs> yes. Here's a microphone. Uh, Sorry. Sorry, we do have um, a couple of groups of uh, figure drawings, clearly drawn directly from the model, right. whole sequences. Mm -hmm. And um, the questioner was asking about teaching. He asked on several occasions, I think when he taught at NYU and Pratt, not to teach painting students. He just wanted to do a life class, a life drawing class. Oh, and okay. I, th I, I can't conjecture about his, um, his reasoning for that exactly, but mm -hmm. it's very striking mm -hmm. if you look through his drawings. Mm. What era are those life drawings from? Um, they would have been in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. And yeah. perhaps there is also a group from a later period, but yeah. uh, because he was teaching pretty much continuously. Mm -hmm. um, so that but, is fascinating that yeah. in his most abstract period, he's doing life drawings. And we also know there's there are still life drawings, which look to me very much like he is. He's I think with still life, he is doing more observation because the it's easy and the objects are around. Um, and that that goes to that breakdown of the whole abstract figurative divide. So thank you, Musa. Well, thank you very much, Harry, and for everyone Great coming question. this evening. Appreciate it. Thank you. And again, please join us downstairs for refreshments in the clay room if you have time. Thanks again.